I'm gonna hold this particular one up because uh, this is one of the best covers I have ever, ever seen. I would pay for this because it looks like a movie poster, quite honestly. But what I like to do when I pick a book up, two things come to mind. There's a story inside the covers and there's a story outside the covers. Because a lot of times we pick up a book in the bookstore or a local library, and there's a brief, brief description of the author's background. That's not enough for me. I want to learn a lot more. So I'm going to start today, first throwing it out to Phil Keith. I want to know about where you came from, your story outside the books that you write. I think that's important. It kind of expands our knowledge of what you do. So jump in right now, Phil. Oh boy, well. Um, I like the old boy question, good way to start. <laughs> I was a poor child who walked to school in the snow five miles a day, no, no, no. Uh, all, all of hell, both ways up hill. Up and both barefoot, ways up hill. And barefoot. <laughs> and barefoot, exactly. Uh, no, I did, I come, I come from a small town in uh, Western Massachusetts and um, one of those places that you're glad you grew up in, but you've never been back to. And that's true with me as the years have gone by. Um, I was not at all certain what I wanted to do in life when I was in high school, but I had a couple of lucky breaks and I ended up um, at a reasonably, reasonably well-known uh, college up in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And um, that was at the height of the <clears throat> Vietnam business. So in addition to deciding what I was going to major in, I had to also decide what I was going to do about my uh, draft status. Uh, luckily at the time I had a uh, cousin who was a bit older than I, and I'd always sort of admired him and the paths that he took in life. And he came up to visit me at Harvard one day and he had just graduated from a naval uh, school in, in uh, Newport, Rhode Island, and he showed up uh, to meet me in Harvard Square in his beautiful, you know, navy blue uniform with the gold buttons, and we decided we would go to lunch and try to catch up on things. And <clears throat> as the day progressed, I happened to notice that all of the best looking girls who, who passed us by were looking at him and not me probably because of that lovely blue and gold uniform. So I decided right then and there that I had to join the Navy. And uh, literally the next Monday morning, I went over to the Naval ROTC unit and uh, signed up. And I decided, uh, well, you know, I'd give them my obligatory two years. It would give me my draft deferment. And then I would go back to law school or whatever the hell it was I was going to do in life. Um, as the Chinese say, when life is what happens to you when you make plans. And um, I ended up spending 24 years in the Navy, <laughs> not just two, and uh, then finally retired. And um, after that went into a business in the educational software world and also got an opportunity to come back to University, uh, first Southampton College and then uh, Long Island University and uh, did some teaching and I loved that. And the teaching required me to do some writing and I'd always wanted to do uh, some uh, either fiction or nonfiction writing. And I said, well, you better get to it because the years are going by. And um, back in 2008, I finally decided to quit everything else that I was doing and sit down and uh, write a book. And it was right about that time I found out about a writer seminar being given by being given by this immensely popular author by the name of Tom Clavin. And uh, he uh, held forth out at the second house in Montauk, wasn't it, Tom? Yeah, it was the Fort Pond House. Yeah, Fort Pond House. Yeah. And uh, gave his writing seminar and, and, and I was hooked. And he was kind enough to review some of the projects that I was doing. And he made a recommendation for 
me to talk to his uh, particular agent. <clears throat> There's another story, but I won't belabor that. Um, and uh, here we are. It's uh, 2021, and um, I think I'm into my 10th book, but I still have a long ways to go to catch up to Tom. All right, so we're going to throw it to Tom. He's got to uh, spend some time thinking about his origin story. So you can't use going uphill both ways and bear right. and stuff like that. So a little bit about your background. We met a few years ago. Yeah. We had lunch together in River. Right. I know of you because of the book you, books you've done uh, with uh, Bob Drew, Bob who's Drew. a great writer and an interesting man in his own right. So a little bit about your background outside the covers of your books. Well, I was a product of the Bronx. Uh, I actually did walk uphill to school. Uh, St. Brendan's always seemed to be at the top of a hill. Uh, <laughs> and that was your penance, by the way. Right, right. And when I left school, my home always seemed to be at the top of the hill. But uh, I, I, can, I can remember always being uh, directed towards writing. Um, I don't want to say directed towards like I was pushed into it. But it was always something that I, I wanted to do. And, and uh, you know, going to school, I was writing. And, and in between school, I was writing. And, and, and when I ended up going to college, it was to, you know, learn more about writing. And, um, and I was always writing. So, uh, you know, one of the things that when I've had the opportunity, whether it's in a college setting or in seminar settings, I've said to people that, that uh, you know, writing is, uh, is is something that can be taught, but I think it's also a craft that people apprentice themselves to. You have to keep doing it. Uh, to me, it's like it's 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 being a carpenter. You know, you can't learn how to build a table by staring at a table and wishing you could duplicate it. You have to get the pieces of wood. You have to get the plane out. You have to start getting to work. And I think with writing, that's also the same thing. So. Um, I uh, did, I don't know if I want to call it a detour, but uh, I found the first opportunities open to me to actually get published, get bylines and make a few dollars with, with journalism. Right. So I uh, began working for smaller publications uh, uh, on the side of working other jobs and eventually got to work for bigger and better publications and uh, wrote for the New York Times for 15 years. and and uh, did a lot of magazine work for years, and then uh, got an opportunity in 1993 to do my first book. And when I say opportunity, it's because I did not suddenly burst upon the scene with, with a book of all of my own. But uh, my, my doorway to getting published uh, as a nonfiction writer was to be, uh, collaborate with people who had expertise in certain fields, but not necessarily writing skills. So my first uh, three or four books, as I recall, were the, the, the person's name in big letters and Tom Clavin in tiny letters. But my name was on the contract, which was just as important uh, as, as the byline, and it introduced me to uh, people in the publishing industry. And I learned again, uh, uh, well, so in, some, in many cases, well, I was still working as an editor and reporter in the journalism business, but I was devoting time to learning what goes on in book publishing, how to do things like craft a book proposal, some of the most basic ways that people were finding to get, to get published and to, to circulate in the publishing industry. And uh, it was about, uh, I think it was in 2003, when I left working for the newspaper business, which I've been doing full time, and turned to uh, uh, writing full time. Uh, so it wasn't something that I got the chance to do when I was very young, it was really, you know, I was, whatever I was in like 2003, I was in my 40s. So, uh, but thankfully, since I made that, 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 that switch to writing full time, I've had one opportunity after another to work as a solo author, to do books with Bob Dury, to right. do book, books with Phil Keith. And, and, and every so often something else crops along. I did a book with Dick Enberg, which was a lot of fun, the sportscaster. And uh, I just consider myself uh, very fortunate that, uh, you know, there are a lot of writers out there who are very, very good writers and have worked very hard, and yet they're still hoping for that opportunity where they can, you know, leave other occupations aside and spend every day devoted to writing. It's it's a it's a it's a wonderful thing, but it by far it does not happen overnight. Right. In a sense, it's a labor of love. We have we have both books here. We have the book Old Blood Runs Red, The Legendary Life of Eugene Ballard, Boxer, Pilot, Soldier, and Spy. 
Bill Keith with Tom Clavin, and then Tombstone, the Earth Brothers, Doc Holliday, and the Vendetta Ride from Hell. So we're gonna weave as best as I can, with the help of both of the writers here, both of the books into the conversation mm -hmm. today. But I want to just first, before we get into the guts of Old Blood Runs Red, no pun intended, how did you guys come together to collaborate? Talk about your roles. I'm going to ask Phil first to talk about that. Well, as I, as I mentioned a few moments ago, Tom was uh, certainly a, a wonderful mentor for me and someone who helped <clears throat> introduce me to the craft and the career uh, of writing. But we certainly didn't. Uh, to go down a road where we figured we'd be uh, writing books together. Uh, we happen to have similar interests uh, in, in many titles, but uh, I don't know that didn't occur to either one of us. <clears throat> it certainly didn't occur to me that he'd want me to tag along on something that he was doing. But in any case, <laughs> uh, I think this was in um, 2016. Um, I was researching a book on uh, World War I, and a chapter in that book was uh, famous <clears throat> American uh, pilots who participated once America uh, got into the war in 1917. And I remember reading a long section on Eddie Rickenbacker, and uh, th there was a story of how um, some of these guys transferred, they were actually flying for France or even other countries. And once America got into it, um, they were invited to come and uh, transfer into the American Air Service. And there was a footnote at the bottom of the page and it said, you know, all these guys went to Paris and they took their physicals and they were immediately accepted into the American Air Service, except one. A pilot whose name was uh, Jean Ballard, and he'd been flying for France for a while, actually had been quite successful. And he was an American. He was born in Columbus, Georgia, and he had an interesting backstory. But <clears throat> he was not accepted into the American Air Service for one reason. He was black. And I'd never heard this guy's name before. And I said, wow, this sounds like a fascinating story. And it was uh, sort of serendipity, but right at the same time, uh, you know, Tom used to uh, write a very wonderful column for the Southampton Press newspapers. I continue to write a column and our editor, Joe Shaw, happened to send both of us an email. And the email was about a fellow that he had been told about from another friend whose name was Gene Ballard. And he said to Tom and I, wouldn't this be a wonderful book? So Tom and I talked about it. We agreed, yes, this would be a great book. And I mean, it was just as simple as that, that we decided to try to tackle this project together. But, you know, I had the military background and Tom had much better background in some of the things, especially boxing and the sports aspect of Gene's life than I had. So it was a, uh, it was a very uh, good collaboration based upon our skill sets. I'm gonna ask uh, also Tom to jump in. But what it fascinates me, we started the conversation with both of you talking about your own journeys, what led you to be here with us today. What's so interesting about Eugene Ballard is his journey from Georgia till at the end, New York City. Just kind of talk about that. And I also think, and correct me if I'm off base, I'm a big fan of Woody Allen's movie called Zelig. Eugene Ballard, in a sense, is the real life version of Zelig. Agree or disagree? Well, I certainly agree. He keeps popping up at different points in history. Uh, and I think one of the things that, uh, you know, Phil mentioned that he first heard about uh, Gene because of his service as a pilot during World War One, And that's pretty remarkable in itself. And if that had been, we could have probably done a book that was all about how he became the first black fighter pilot, American black fighter pilot. Uh, but as we did some more research, what fascinated to us is that aspect of a journey. 
with these highlights along the way, not just one highlight, not just not just not just three highlights, but uh, his childhood, his resiliency of running away from home from Georgia when he was only 11 years old, his stowing away to Europe, his becoming a middleweight boxing contender, uh, his, uh, his his service in World War II, both first as a soldier in the trenches and then as a pilot. Uh, his uh, his role in the uh, uh, what they called the crazy years in Paris in the 1920s and being a nightclub entrepreneur, becoming a, uh, a spy, uh, sort of like a black Bogart in the 1930s as the Germans started to infiltrate Paris and his service back again in World War II and the early civil rights pioneer and on and on and on. So he does keep showing up at these different points in history in different places. So. Uh, I think that we we felt I certainly felt like we had kind of a tiger by the tail. Could we? Uh, I felt kind of daunted because we had this remarkable life that, for the most part, nobody knew about. And could we pull this story together and convey it in an engaging, accurate, engaging way? So, uh, I, certainly from my perspective, this became a, a more interesting and challenging project than I expected it was going to be. Now, originally, we had this set up for a previous date and we had to reschedule because of COVID. And ironically, tomorrow's Martin Luther King Day. Mm. And when I sit down to read a book for what I do, I want to learn something I don't know. That is really important to me because the one thing I do know is a lot of things I don't know. And unless I came across the book, Old Blood Runs Red, I never would have known about Eugene mm -hmm. Ballard. Mm -hmm. You guys, that is a service to my education, but also to a lot of people. And I imagine a lot of people know about Martin Luther King and John Lewis and everybody else because they're in the conversation every day in the political ethos mm -hmm. in terms of Black Lives Matter. You've done a service with this book. Can you just talk about that, about bringing to light somebody a majority of the people didn't know anything about, and here you create this book and this story, and we're talking about it today, Phil, one day before Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Yeah, one, yeah, one of the things that uh, Tom and I <clears throat> have agreed that here's an example of, of a young man who came from the most, the, the poorest background you could possibly imagine, uh, his father even being um, born into slavery in the 1860s. And uh, every time this kid turns around in his life and people try to knock him down. Now, as Tom mentioned, he literally was a boxer. So getting knocked down was something that he became a little bit used to. But there were many other times when he got turned away or, or pushed down or uh, slapped down and he would always jump back up and move on and he seemed to rise higher and higher and overcome more and more obstacles along the way and both of us I think are proud that uh, this is a story that is um, could be uh, very instrumental in providing um, young black men and women, a role model for adversity and how to overcome adversity, I guess, is, is the main point uh, I would make. And uh, in addition to the book, uh, fortunately for us, having become you know, quite popular and, and uh, best-selling, um, we're very pleased that that story uh, of this individual has gotten out there and uh, is beginning to have that sort of effect. Can I challenge you for a minute? There has been some discussion and controversy about white people writing about black African Americans. Mm -hmm. I think you did a great service, but I wonder if you're cognizant of that challenge to white people covering issues dealing with black African, well, that's done, African Americans. Did, did anybody challenge you on that in terms of this book? We thought we would be, but Larry, it, it's pretty amazing. We really haven't been. And, you know, P 
people, I'm sure, either say to themselves or, or maybe say to someone else, you know, what? <laughs> how do these two white guys come up with this story and, and uh, bring it forward? This story was available to anyone, black, white, pink, or purple, for the last 60 years and should have been told and wasn't told. Right. And, you know, we were lucky to find it and bring it forward. And I hope, I think, uh, we've done it in such a fashion that it does credit to Gene Ballard's background, his race, and his uh, many adventures as well. I'm, I know Tom has some thoughts on this too, but, but my main thought is uh, anybody could have had this story. Uh, we were just lucky to get it. All right, I'm going to kind of segue over to Tom's book, Tombstone, The Earp Brothers, Doc Holliday, and the Vendetta Ride from Hell. At the top, we ask you to share a little bit about your personal journey. Talk about the journey that led to the establishment of Tombstone and brought people there. And also part of that story is something called the Dragoon Mountains. Mm. I found that so interesting. And by the way, I'm going to take some personal privilege. I read the review of your book, I think when the New York Times, mm -hmm. we communicated back and forth. I read the book. I don't know what they read. I know what I read. I know how important interviews, uh, reviews are for writers because other people see, especially because in the New York Times, but I think this is a terrific book. I learned so much because there are TV shows about legends and all these people that you write about. And then there's the reality of what you write about. So let's talk about all that I'm throwing out to you, especially because there was no tombstone and there was tombstone, but how was it established? What drew people there? And also the origins of also the history of the area, which is fascinating, the Dragoon Mountains. Well, that's a big reason for doing the book because <clears throat> you certainly, by writing a book about Tombstone, I wasn't writing about something that had never been written about before, <laughs> that hadn't been portrayed in movies, many, many movies. <clears throat> um, but uh, what I wanted to do with, with Tombstone and why it's simply called Tombstone as its lead title before you get into the subtitle is because I wanted to explore, but in addition to, of course, the gun by the O.K. Brown, the Herb Brothers, and and Doc Holliday and the the Herb Vendetta ride and all those other aspects, fascinating aspects of the story. But what Tombstone represented, which I think gets overlooked, Tombstone was really the final frontier. Uh, you know, it was in Arizona. There had been this migration that you could say began with Daniel Boone crossing the mountains into Kentucky, right. westward, westward, westward. After the Civil War, you know, it got reinvigorated this movement westward across Texas, across New Mexico, into Arizona. And you couldn't go for Arizona was it was it. I mean, if you once you got to Arizona heading west, you bumped up into California, which was settled. You know, that was not unexplored. Right. So Tombstone had that distinction of being uh, what could be called the last boom town. A silver, an enormous silver strike was, was made, and people were coming from all over. And almost overnight, Tombstone was created and started to build itself and build itself in a way that it wanted to be a sophisticated city of the future, build itself as the San Francisco of the Southwest. And it was really that flashpoint of where the old West, what you can call the wild West, came up against a, a people that wanted to just be called the West. They just wanted the West. They wanted the West of the future. They wanted a place where they could build schools, build churches, build businesses, raise families. And yet you still had the cowboy faction and the, the corrupt rancher faction. And all those who wanted to hold on to the past. So the Dragoon Mountains was part of was was the closest mountain range to Tombstone. It's where for for centuries really uh, Native American tribes had had, had lived there. Uh, it was a source of water, which was very important for Tombstone, and that which was on, on a dry valley type of area. And so uh, I found that a fascinating part of the story is and an appointed part of the story because. When Tombstone gets tamed, I guess you could say, which is, you know, that was part of what the gunfight the OK Corral was about. I mean, that literally was a clash between Old and New West. Uh, when Tombstone gets tamed, 
the poignant part about it is the frontier was kind of like over as we had known it, as, as we know it today, Gunsmoke and other uh, uh, longtime television shows. Uh, in fact, it was only 70 years after the Earth Met Dead Arrive ended in 1882 that the Department of the Interior declared the frontier closed. It wasn't that every place was settled, it was that the undiscovered country had by this point been discovered. And there was no new frontier to be found in the lower 48 anyway. So, so that's a big reason for, for doing the book because I wanted to put Tombstone in its, in, in its time and its place in its context. And then within that, the fascinating characters who inhabited it. And here's a question for both of you. Two different books, but I think there's a commonality here because these are books that are um, nonfiction. And I think it's even a harder question for you, Phil, because there's probably less information. Let him have it then. Okay, you're going to get it both. Less information to go on. But when you do your research, how do you separate fact from fiction? And as you know, I think of the Marlboro Man, the man who's the West. You know, there's a lot of stories. There's there's books. There's dime novels. There's newspaper accounts. There's their own bios throwing out there to make themselves look really great. How do you come to the realization when you write this book, you've got to make it as accurate as possible, not caught up in everything that's out there to separate the wheat from the chaff. That is a major challenge. If any writers out there are listening, research is everything if you want the book to ring true. And I'll throw the question back to Phil because as I said before, none of us knew who Eugene Ballard was. We know about Tombstone, so was it difficult for you or both you guys to do your research and then make it as accurate as possible? Well, I think the two most important words in a book like <clears throat> All Blood and the Life of uh, Jean Ballard are due diligence. And uh, you will come to know quickly if you happen to read the book that we, we based the book in great part on Jean's unpublished <clears throat> autobiography, which he himself uh, took great pains to write down at the very last days of his life. And as he reflected back over his remarkable life and looking ahead to hopefully selling a book that would provide some income after he was gone, because he knew he was dying for his children, you know, he maybe perhaps, as we have said, forgot a few details or embellished a few details about his life. And uh, we had to try very hard to make sure <clears throat> that we got it right. Example, uh, Gene had uh, three children. Unfortunately, his only son died in infancy uh, of pneumonia, but he had two lovely daughters who grew up to have husbands and children of their own. But his wife, uh, the mother of those uh, two girls, uh, Jean, uh, uh, for uh, probably 40 years before he died, uh, told the world that uh, he had lost his wife and she had passed away, which we found to be totally untrue. In fact, <laughs> She lived uh, to be almost 90 years old and, and long after, uh, you wanna do this, go ahead. <laughs> uh, but uh, we, we, had to, we had to do a lot of uh, really hard work to make sure, well, I guess what we called it, we called it triangulation. In other words, if there was a, a piece of uh, Gene's life that we needed to make sure we had down correctly. We always tried to triangulate, which means making an intersection of at least three points, as the old navigators would say, as they cross the seas by starlight uh, to get a fix. Um, you know, you wanna make sure that you've got resources that can back you up. So we actually discovered that the vast majority of what Gene told about his life, uh, what was true. But uh, you're right, Larry, in that uh, we had to work and every author sh in this genre should work very hard to, to get it right. You want to pay back on that? But that book or this book? Well, I, I, I uh, 
to basically deal with both, but Phil mentioned uh, Gene's autobiography. I had the good fortune, my very first solo book was a biography, and this is going back 18 years, 18, 19 years ago, a biography of, of Gene Hagen, of, of Walter Hagen. Golfer. The golfer. The golfer. The golfer. You're one of the few people I think who today would know who Walter Hagen is. Well, Walter Hagen was a great, great, uh, you know, uh, player in the 1920s and 1930s. And uh, how overjoyed I was to find an obscure copy of his autobiography. And I said, gosh, this book's going to be easy to write. He's already written his story for me. I just have to correct the spelling. Well, he, he, he made up most of his autobiography. It's, it's really about 70% fiction. And thank good, thankfully, I dug in and discovered that instead of really embarrassing myself, which actually made my job twice as hard because I had to sift through that and discover what 30% was usable and what 70% had to be hunted down and corrected. So that lesson stayed with me with every nonfiction book I've done since then. You can't take your sources at face value. Some are clearly a little more reliable than others. <clears throat> but um, in the case of, of Eugene Bullitt, we, we, his, his autobiography was, uh, was very important to us, but there were so many other ways, as, as Phil explained, we could cover that. In the case of Tombstone, I think that's especially a good example because you have so many movies have been done about Tombstone. You've had books by, by other people. You've had books about Wyatt Earp, for example, starting with Frontier Marshall in 1932, which at least 50% embellished and made up. So um, I think what is important, if anybody is watching this and has an interest in nonfiction writing, uh, and I think to younger writers in general, is that uh, you can't take sources for granted and you have to double check and triple check everything. And you can't just find a, a source and say, oh good, I'm gonna take the most exciting parts of this and I'm gonna include it in my story. That exciting part may have been completely fictionalized. Uh, the good news is, which I found when doing Tombstone and the, and the two previous books in the trilogy, Dodge City and Wild Bill, is that when you find out what the actual facts are, what actually happened, um, they are just as if not more intriguing and enjoyable and exciting as the embellished, fictionalized stories that have been passed out over the decades. We had this conversation before for a podcast episode, which should be coming up hopefully in the next couple of weeks, or Art for Periscope. And we talked about movies and TV programs. And I think one of the best movies I've ever seen is Clint Eastwood's Unforgiven. Mm -hmm. How accurate was that? Because that's not a glamorized version of the old West, especially the role of quote unquote, the gunfighter. Mm -hmm. In that particular case, it's, that's an interesting subject because uh, I, it's possible that the main character, or I, I think his name was Money, uh, Bill Money, I think it was the Eastwood's character, his name. I don't know that that's based on a real character or not. So, if, if, but either way, the film is fiction, but it depicts the West of that time, I think, very accurately, which is not a very glamorous place. No. I mean, certainly, if you're, if you're going by television shows in the 1950s and 60s, yeah, it's great to turn on the television and you're seeing Steve McQueen and Richard Boone and Jim Arness and, and Lauren Green, and nobody ever looks really dirty. Now and everything seems to work. Well and scrubbed. The TV well scrubbed. Screen. And when you fight, shoot at somebody, you hit them with the first bullet. Right. Everybody knows how to shoot like Wild Bill Hickok. So uh, uh, that doesn't take away anything. I mean, I think the, 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 the film, is, the Eastwood film is a, is a great, uh, great movie. And I think one reason why it found so much favor, not only in this part of the Atlantic, but in Europe too, was because it did not glamorize anything about the West. We have tended to glamorize the West uh, in, our, in our way, in our desire to, to further mythologize, apologize the American West. And you said, by the way, that Doc Holliday was a terrible shot. Is that accurate? He, he couldn't hit the broad side of a barn. That's why it's kind of an amusing little aside when, they're, when the Earp brothers are getting together to go to the OK Corral. And Virgil Lopez, the Virgil or Cruz the Marshal, has to hold his nose and deputize Doc Holliday. And he, he, he hands Doc Holliday a shotgun. It wasn't just arbitrary. It's like maybe with some luck, with a shotgun, Doc could hit something. And hopefully the other guy, not us. All right. I want, I'm going to reference another movie for Phil Keith. And the movie I just saw, and it's an amazing craft of storytelling. The movie's called 1917. 
I don't know if you had a chance to see it, but it gives you, a, I think, an honest depiction of war is hell. It's not a John Wayne movie. And if you know anything about how movies are made, what they did was amazing. It's almost like one tracking shot through the whole movie. So I don't know if you had a chance to see the movie, Phil, uh, 1917, but you do write about the horrors of war because Eugene Goulart was an inf infantryman first and then a pilot. And as a kid, I made uh, model airplanes. I think the model airplanes I made as a kid were sturdier than some of the things that they trained on and flew on. So did you have a chance to see the movie 1917? And if you didn't, just talk about War is Hell in terms of what you cover in your book. I did see 1917 and I thought it was a magnificent uh, movie. I thought that uh, Sam Mendes uh, did a phenomenal job in, in getting it right. And the, the two young men who end up being the uh, main characters <clears throat> in the movie, uh, uh, I think did a fabulous job. It, it did remind me very much of what uh, Jean Villard experienced in the trenches, especially in 1915 and 1916, which were two of the worst years of a very, very terrible war. And <clears throat> uh, he uh, unfortunately was uh, wounded at least three times that we know of, and once quite seriously, which led in an ironic way to his becoming a fighter pilot, because uh, after he recovered from the wound he received in the trenches, the doctors told him, well, you're done, that's it, Bell. Um, you know, thank you for your service, and there's nothing more you can do. But the war wasn't over, and Gene insisted that he still wanted to do his part. And the only thing that the doctors thought he might be able to accomplish was to sit very still in the back of an airplane uh, with a machine gun and try to shoot down other aircraft, which is how he got into the aviation business to begin with. But uh, the persistent soul that he was, he wasn't going to be happy with just being a machine gunner sitting in the back. He wanted to sit in the front and fly the thing. And uh, he got a chance uh, to do that, again, with his uh, persistence and a bit of luck. And he always claimed, in fact, he carried around a business card uh, until the very end of his life. And on the bottom of the bus business card, he had printed, first Negro military pilot. And uh, of course we had to, Tom and I tracked down that claim too. He was indeed the first African-American fighter pilot, but he was not the first Afri African-American military pilot, but he was the first to get into a fight, a so-called fighter aircraft, if you could consider those contraptions to be viable fighter aircraft. I want to move along a little bit because this fascinates me and I'll tell you why it's another part of the journey of Eugene Ballard and we're going to touch upon the Roaring Twenties. But here's what I want to mention because I don't know if people know this. There's a new book coming out. It's a novel. It's called Nick by Michael Ferris Smith. It's about Nick Carraway after World War I ending up in Paris during the Roaring Twenties. This is a fascinating time in history. So talk about Eugene's zealot moment in the Roaring Twenties because a lot of famous people came through the places, the bars, the cafes that he worked and managed. It's a great, great story. Just kind of give us a feel for it. Well, I'll start out, but uh, Tom has done a lot of research in this area too. When Gene uh, was finished with the war, or the war was finished with him. Um, he went back to Paris, and of course, there weren't many jobs available for fighter pilots. So he knew he would have to do something, and he'd been injured badly enough that he wasn't going to be able to get back into his previous career of boxing either. And he sort of became fascinated very quickly with jazz and jazz music and the nightclub scene that he and his pals were out and about enjoying. And he decided he wanted to become a musician. Well, this is yet another career that he 
just picked up and uh, a friend of his loaned him a, a set of drums, which he knew nothing about and certainly didn't know how to play, but he was a great learner, a fast learner and a wonderful mimic. And he sat down and started to um, copy some of the moves that he saw the jazz drummers making. And fortunately for Gene, you didn't have to be all that good. You just had to be loud because of the uh, nightclub scene in, in, in Paris in, in those days. Well, actually he not only became loud, he became over time quite good and uh, very much into the music scene and very much into being able to meet some fascinating people, as you said, Larry, of uh, the 20s and, and, and 30s in Paris. And I'll let Tom take a crack at this story now at this point. Yeah, this was like a, a gossip column about uh, the, the, the nighttime activities of the nightclubs that Jean Bullard managed and all. It, it, it just be a wall of bald faced names. <clears throat> you know, Fred and a, and a sister Adele Astaire, and you had Cole Porter, and you had uh, Zelda and Scott Fitzgerald. You know, anyway, in fact, uh, there's a character, the character of the black jazz drummer in The Sun Also Rises is based on Eugene Bullard. They were friends in, in Paris. And the Castle Blanca <laughs> reference, too? Was there a the, Castle Blanca? Castle Blanca reference because uh, Dooley Wilson who later appeared in the movie Casablanca and sang and played against Sam, was an entertainer at, at Bullard's nightclub in Paris years before. Uh, and you had, uh, you know, uh, uh, Langston Hughes was a dishwasher for Eugene Bullard. <clears throat> uh, so that was part of the fun part of it because uh, uh, it also gave us, it, it was a valuable service for us too because it allowed us to cross check some of these things that were in Bullard's autobiography about those years, because you can look at the biographies or autobiographies of others. You know, he made a reference, let's say to Louis Armstrong. Well, we can go to, I mean, Lawrence Bergreen is probably considered his version of probably considered the definitive yeah. Louis Armstrong biography. And you can go in there and read about, you know, oh yes, they did know each other. And in fact, uh, to Phil's point about uh, Gene Bullard becoming a good drummer, Years later, when he returned to the United States, uh, had to escape uh, Europe during the war and returned to the United States, uh, he became a studio musician for Louis Armstrong. So I'm sure he could have, Louis had, at that point in his career, had access to the best of the best. And, and there's actually recordings, you can find them on YouTube with Eugene Bullard playing, playing drums on Louis Armstrong's songs. So uh, again, going back to something that we said earlier uh, in, this, in this interview, uh, you know, we kept peeling back these layers and finding even more fascinating things about this man's life. And, you know, one of the, I might be anticipating one of your questions, but one of the issues that, that's being confronted about the efforts to turn this into a screen version is that what do you do? It's almost like an embarrassment of riches. Do you, too much. Do you take one aspect of his life or do you do, so like the mini series approach and try and cover, you know, sort of like an autobiography of Miss Jane Pittman Starting Eugene Malloy from young young years to his mild days. Has anybody approached you guys? Because this is a mini series in the making. Yeah, we you know it's 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 been you know just to be blunt about it, it's been frustrating for us because when the book first came out, we were approached by a number of different people, and uh, the agent that we had decided to go with one. I see very very promising. It was a very prominent African American uh, producer. Uh, and she hired a writer to adapt the story. Right. And that's where we ran to the roadblock because the producer had the idea of let's take one segment of his life and highlight that. And the writer said, you can't do that because there's so much to his life. I think it should be a multi-purpose thing. And it just seems that that uh, loggerheads, uh, uh, I wouldn't call it a dispute because I don't think it got to that point, but it was just that they couldn't agree on the right approach. And then you had COVID shut everything down on top of that. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of hoping now that it's a new year, we're hoping things are going to be start opening up again, certainly in Hollywood. And uh, we really need to revive that effort because, you know, it would make a fantastic story. Here's, I, did, I just thought about this right now. I love, I read the book, Haley's book, Roots. Mm -hmm. I love Roots. Mm -hmm. One thing I thought about Roots, and I wonder if you guys also think about that. The one thing that always bothers me just a little bit 
is what happened to all the people left behind. Mm -hmm. There are so many people, Eugene's Bullard's life going back to Georgia, the family tree and, and the people that he interacted with and he moves on and he moves on and he moves on. That always fascinates me about people left behind that we never know about because they've been left behind. And I think about, do you think about that at all, weaving that into a potential series? Because very rarely are there codas that somebody's story, it just pretty much ends, they're afterwards. And I think you touched yeah. upon them tombstone, but that, that, well, I that think Phil, interests me. Yeah, Phil especially, you know, I'll let him carry the ball on this one, Phil especially made uh, strong efforts to try and track down members of his family who may still be in Georgia or elsewhere. Uh, and, and another reason I'll turn over to Bill in a second for doing that also is that we wanted to make sure that if the book got published, if the book sold copies, if the book got made into a screen version, uh, is there an estate out there? Is, is there, are there family, are there you know, descendants who really should at least be informed about what's happening? And, and Phil, you, you, you did an extensive uh, search for that. Yeah, we uh, we sure did. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't have a lot of concrete results. Um, we know that uh, Gene's parents had uh, uh, ten children, uh, only seven of which really really uh, reached adulthood, and uh, <laughs> all of them being really uh, dirt floor poor. Uh, at the time, they didn't leave much of a uh, written legacy behind, but we did run across uh, one sister and one brother in particular. And unfortunately, um, his older brother, Hector, uh, wouldn't you know it, he was lynched in a land dispute in the 1930s when Gene was probably at the height of his fame and fortune in, in Paris. And um, we uh, now know about and are in contact with, you know, that side uh, of the family. Uh, but, you know, their interest is in uh, tracking down uh, Gene's brother and what happened to him and the consequences and so on and so forth. There was also one grandson who um, followed Gene into the military somewhat. Uh, enlisting in the United States Air Force when he came of age and actually made a career of it and retired as a master sergeant from the Air Force. Um, and he was instrumental in having Gene's uh, materials uh, put into a display and dedicated at the uh, Air Force Museum in Ohio. But after uh, he retired, uh, he moved to California and then moved to Canada and sort of disappeared. And we were unable to track him down. We don't really even know whether he's alive or not. But uh, we tried very hard to track down uh, Gene's legacy. And that's the extent to which we were able to really uh, see where his descendants ended up. So I'm going to pick back on that for you, Book Tombstone. What do we know about the Earp brothers and all the principals, Doc Holliday, the Clinton? family after the book ends to their family trees because I find that really interesting. White Earp is a big name, but life goes on after the vendetta, the ride from hell and everything else. And that fascinates me about what happens to all the principals and their family members down the road. Yeah, you have six Earp brothers, uh, one of which had left the family very early on and, and, and never returned and lived in California as a particular house developer. Uh, but uh, but uh, Virgil, who had been almost killed in Tombstone, and um, uh, his life was basically, you know, in the case of, of when Morgan died in Tombstone, uh, Warren, the youngest brother, was killed in a gunfight uh, separately from Tombstone. Uh, basically, you had, you had uh, Wyatt and his older brother Virgil and they led lives of real restlessness. They always were searching. It's, again, I use the word poignant. They came to Tombstone. There were five brothers together in Tombstone at that time. That's a big reason why they got together in Tombstone to become business people, to finally uh, find that, that brass ring that had been eluding them and eluding the Earth family for decades. And, and once they left Tombstone, uh, 
they they kept searching in vain. Uh, why, uh, you know, an advantage to Tombstone is he met the woman who would be his fourth wife. And four wives? Well, yes, yeah. Uh, Wyatt had an interesting domestic situation. He had four wives, some of them overlapped. Um, and you uh, want to expand on that? Or just <laughs> out there. Yeah, he, he, he never left one wife before he had the next one, you know. Well, he's kind of fake. Yeah, yeah he, <laughs> he always wanted to jump off one rock. And let him uh. But uh, but he got right on the fourth try because he and his fourth wife were together for 45 years. But it was a very uh, uh, journey 45 years. They roamed all across the country, he even owned a saloon in Alaska. He sold real estate in San Diego. Uh, he never quite uh, became the business respectable businessman, which is what he'd been yearning to be. And at the very end of his life, he's uh, living in Los Angeles uh, with Josephine, who was his wife. And uh, he eked out a living the uh, last couple of two, three years as a consultant to uh, silent film westerns being made in Hollywood. And, and one particular director took a shine to him, was named John Ford. Uh, and, yeah. And so, um, so that, that's, there's, uh, you know, it wasn't necessarily a happy life, but on the other hand, it was like why it was like, I'll just take things as they come. You know, he, he just, you know, he, he, he I, I think he was glad to be alive, to have a companion by his side. And over time, we recognized that that was a double edged sword because sometimes he was recognized with a lot of ludicrous fictionalized stories that came up about him. All right, there is a part of the book, Old Blood Runs Red, that made me go, you can't make this. Just uh, one part? <laughs> well, I don't want to go on all day, all day, because there are many, many parts, right. but you guys are very kind of uh, spending some time with all of us. Uh, um, Eugene Ballard now is back in New York City, and that journey's a story, too. That's why you have to pick up the book and read it. He is an elevator operator. Uh, on the elevator, it takes Dave Garraway to the Today Show. Tell us that story. Well, <clears throat> at the uh, end of Eugene's uh, interesting and, and uh, very uh, delightful life, he uh, suffering from many physical ailments, uh, obviously some of the wounds that he had suffered was somewhat limited in the uh, opportunities they had to uh, for gainful employment. And one of his ex-military buddies happened to turn him on to an opportunity that he had heard about at Rockefeller Center for elevator operators and, you know, running a car up and down uh, in, inside an elevator shaft in the building uh, all day long was at least uh, gainful employment that didn't require a lot of physical exertion. So Gene happily took the job and he had to wear an elevator operator's uniform every day. And he had the delightful and somewhat quixotic habit of taking one of the many medals that he had earned, either from the government, mostly from the government of France and pinning one of the medals to his elevator operator's uniform every day and as Larry said a minute ago one day uh, no less a, a contemporary personage than Dave Garraway of the early Today Show gets on the elevator and and here's Gene who's he, he's probably seen a thousand times and Gene's wearing this new very gaudy uh, scarlet uh, green silver uh, decoration on his uniform and Garraway automatically assumes it must be a, a trinket from some Negro marching band that uh, Gene had joined and Garraway looks at him and says, well, Gene, what, what, what is that you're wearing today? And <laughs> Gene says, well, it, it's a uh, decoration from uh, France and it's uh, for valor and it's France's highest uh, military decoration. And of course, Garraway is incredulous. You know, how, how in heaven's name did you get that? And uh, he begins to tell him the story and Garraway says, you, you gotta be kidding. He said, come with me. And he takes Gene off the elevator and they sit down and they craft out, um, you know, the 30 minute version of Gene's life story. And four or five days later, he's on 
the Today Show showing off uh, all of his medals. Now you talk about your 15 minutes of fame. Yeah. Gene had, had many, many moments of fame, but unfortunately not in his native country. But finally, because of the medium of national television um, in the Today Show, he does at last get some recognition that 15 minutes of American fame that uh, he more than, than deserved. It goes beyond that, it's another story. He's invited to an event with the uh, French Embassy in New York City. At that event, you want to tell me the people who are watching this right now who was there with him? <laughs> well, it was a reception for Charles de Gaulle, President of France. He had come to America to meet with President Eisenhower, and they were strategizing on. Uh, uh, what to do about Nikita Khrushchev, but uh, at this ceremony at the 69th Street Armory, probably familiar to uh, many of you, um, this huge reception, uh, Gene is invited as, a, as an honored guest and in strides Charles de Gaulle and he comes up to the front of the room to the applause of the many hundreds of people there and he looks around and he says, where is Monsieur Boulard? And there was Jean. And that was the one person that Charles de Gaulle wanted especially to meet. And he walked over and grabbed his hand and gave him one of those big French bear hugs. And uh, that became certainly one of the highlights of uh, Jean's life because de Gaulle knew his story well. And in France, Jean was very much a revered national hero of France. Was, also, Josephine, was Josephine Baker also there? I was just going to say the other person that uh, uh, was there that uh, Jean very much wanted to um, see again after many years was the famous Josephine Baker. They had both been awarded the same medal, by the way. Not many people know that Josephine Baker, like Jean Ballard, although not together, uh, had both uh, done a lot of work uh, spying for the French against the Nazis at the beginning of World War II. Uh, one last question for you, possibly. <laughs> you never know. At the end of his life, was he unhappy or was he satisfied? the direction of his life took? Well, we could both answer that. My answer would be, I think he was at peace with himself. I think he was very much at peace with what uh, he had accomplished. And in fact, uh, it was reported that his dying words were, it's okay, it's all easy. And that was said in context to the person who happened to be sitting with him at that moment, a woman by the name of uh, Louise Connell, who had uh, agreed to take his longhand scribblings in French and turn it into his autobiography. And she had managed to uh, type it up in uh, English in legible form uh, literally days before Gene passed, and those are his those are his last words. I think he was quite uh, pleased with what he had been able to accomplish. Tom, I don't know how do you think? Well, I think he may have been looking at his accomplishments, and I suspect he was also thinking about his daughters. You know, they had been very very important to him. He had, there's a dramatic moment in the book where he's reunited with them during World War II after they had been separated. And they came to live in New York and they each got married and he had grandchildren. And I, I also think that in addition to his medals and his accomplishments, he was thinking about he was, he was leaving behind family, which uh, from, the, from the family situation he'd grown up in was, I think, a good, perhaps, he, I'm sure he considered that a great achievement. All right, here's what I like to do. When I go home, hours later, or on the drive back, I think of that I ask a really lousy question. <laughs> I also think that I miss asking a really important question. 
So I'll ask both of you to chance to, in a sense, interview yourself. Over the course of our discussion here at the library, have I missed anything? Is there something I should have asked that I didn't? Phil, you first. Uh, let me think. Uh, no, I think uh, we've covered a good, uh, a good deal of ground. Um, I think uh, we've hit uh, some of the highlights. Uh, there are many more that you can't squeeze into uh, this particular short period of time. But um, I mean, I, you, you, the readers will find a, a lot of stories among the story of, of his life, uh, some of them quite sad and some of them uh, amusing. Um, so uh, uh, we, we talked about it a little bit, but I think it, 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 it deserves reinforcement that we really feel very strongly that uh, Gene is a role model and we'd love to get this story out even further than it has gotten out so that uh, we can <clears throat> enhance that role model status for a lot of young women who could really, I think, benefit from his story. Tom? I think that uh, one thing that people will find if they get a chance to read All Blood Runs Red is that, uh, that I want to make sure we emphasize, is Gene is a very complicated man. You know, he had, he, he's a handsome, charismatic man. People like to smile, he can lit, light up a room. But uh, the, the book is not about somebody who just waltzed his way through life and everything came, you know, he, got, he got lucky, you know, one time. He did have luck, and stuff, but, but, but he's very kind. He, he was very much uh, uh, angered by racism and he would fight back both in generally and, and personally. Uh, there's there's fight, literally fights that he's in because uh, he's being, uh, uh, because of prejudice. And, uh, and, and very complicated, and I think that that comes through also that you're talking about a person who is completely a 360 degree person. And I think that's important to know about, about uh, Gene Bullard. He's, he's not just, I mean, Zelig, as you mentioned, uh, it's a fascinating movie, and I haven't seen it in years. I'd love to see it again. But uh, he's more than just Zelig, who somebody just pops up. And, you know, he's, he becomes very much a part of his times. Just to reinforce that, he was at the Peak Skill Riots mm. with Paul Robeson. And if I remember, and if I'm misstating this, I believe he was also beaten up mm -hmm. during those riots. Is that accurate? Correct. Yeah, we, uh, among his many, <laughs> his many accomplishments was being a very early civil rights pioneer and standing up against that racism and prejudice, which unfortunately, has once again reared its ugly head in very recent events. And um, I'm sure that if Gene were alive today, he'd recognize it quickly, readily, and he'd be out there with his uh, boxing gloves on trying to uh, do something about it. All right. You two work very well together. Mm -hmm. Is there a new project in the works you can tell us about for both of you together? Well, we had, you know, thankfully, uh, Hanover Square Press, our publisher, uh, was so pleased by the, not only the quality of the book, but that it, it sold, it, it sold pretty well, that uh, we, we're doing a, a separate book, but it's quite different. It's called, uh, I mean, the title right now is To the Uttermost Ends of the Earth. And it's a civil war story, but not a civil war land-based story. <clears throat> it's about, uh, most people I think don't know that there was the two, the two, the greatest battle involving American ships involved two American ships fighting each other. And it took place in 18, June 1864 with the, uh, uh, the CSS Alabama uh, and, and the, uh, the Pierce, USS Kearsarge. And it's how these two ships sort of um, tried to catch each other all around the world and then finally did on this fateful day and had a historic and dramatic uh, broadside after broadside battle at sea. So uh, it's, it's a very much a, a, a different story, but we also think it's, it's uh, the same thing, a lot of accurate information, but exciting. All right, before you guys go, I'm remind all the audience, the books are Old Blood Runs Red, A Legendary Life, Eugene Millar, Box of Pilot, Soldier Spy, Bill Keith with Tom Clavin, and also the best book cover I've seen in a long, long time, Tombstone. 
New York Brothers, Doc Holliday, and the Vendetta Ride to Hell. Guys, you're very generous with your time. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us. Thank you.